This is Big Ideas from the ABC. My name is Michael Williams and I'm director of the Wheeler Centre. I'm delighted to chair tonight's debate. It's great to have so many of you here on a night when I'm sure you've got a new episode of Breaking Bad waiting for you at home to watch. Um, so thank you for giving us a bit of your time before you return to your illegal downloading. Um, ladies and gentlemen, the proposition before this House is that copyright is dead, long live the pirates. I invite Suralette Dreyfus to address this House with her arguments for the affirmative. Good evening. More than 15 years ago, a writer in Melbourne wrote an unusual book, the first of its kind. Over the first few years, it sold respectably, eventually reaching close to uh, 10,000 copies, which for a book in Australia is, is good outcome. And that would have been the end of the story. But something interesting happened. Her far-sighted researcher on the book suggested releasing the text of the book on the internet for free. At first, she was reluctant. How could she ever make a living giving away the book for free on the internet in electronic format? That didn't make any sense. It is true she was only seeing about a dollar per sale of every $20 book, but in the end, how are you going to make money? But she decided to take the gamble. Here's what happened next. In the first two years, after the book was released for free, there were more than 400,000 downloads of the entire book not just chapter by chapter. The author started getting emails from people who'd never heard of her work, but who wanted to buy paper copies of the book. A New Zealand artist built an installation uh, art in a gallery based on the book. Computer programmers from around the world contacted her, offered to put the book in 21 different electronic e-reader formats. She got a letter from a, a, a man, a fan, who had read all 500 pages on his handheld reader in the bathtub. She got a letter from a poor blind man in Guatemala who wrote to thank her saying he had read her book via his computer speaking the book out loud. Two movies were based on, made based on the book and it was translated into seven other languages and the book has since been republished many times. That book is called Underground and I am that writer. The researcher was named Julian Assange. The irony is that much of the success of the book happened long before Assange became famous for other things. The success happened because he had convinced me to withhold the digital copyright from the publisher and then to free it by releasing the book for free on the internet. The idea conceptualized the end of copyright as we knew it well ahead of time. It also contributed to my financial success as an artist far more than if I had not done this. Copyright means control. Controlling society, controlling ideas, and most of all, controlling money. And that leads to my first point. Let's not pretend that copyright exists to protect artists anymore. It doesn't. In the digital world, old world companies are just using it as a way to siphon off money to protect out-of-date industries. Let's talk about bears, particularly Winnie the Pooh. Winnie the Pooh was first published in 1926. It was due to go into the public domain in 2001. That means that it would have belonged to all of us, to all the children of the world. But the copyright police, such as Disney and the recording and motion picture industry lobbyists, sunk their teeth into the US Congress's behinds, forcing them to pass legislation extending copyright for another 20 years. So Winnie went back into private hands for another 20 years. This is a loss for all societies. Now, the copyright cheerleading squad over this side, who you'll hear from shortly, will argue that we need copyright to provide an income for artists to produce more art. But author of Winnie the Pooh, A.A. Milne, no longer needs to make a living from his work in order to write more books. That would be because he's been dead since 1956. And copyright is about as useful to him as a screen door on a submarine. But that didn't stop Disney and others reaching into his grave to pull a bear out and run away with it. So remember, also, if, even if there was no copyright ever, there are lots of other ways for artists to make a living from their creative work. So musicians can give live performances, painters can sell their paintings. Now to my second argument. Pirating actually has benefit for the artist and society as a whole. It's copyright that's actually costing us. 
Much of the economic evidence indicates that piracy does not hurt artists and creators. You'd think that if someone pirates a song, that would mean one less sale of that song, right? Or so the cheerleading, cheerleading squad would have us believe, but actually that's not true. So studies, especially those led by Joel Waldfogel, show that pirating one song will still result in four out of five people making that purchase who would have otherwise made that purchase. So quite substantial. It doesn't do the kind of damage to the industry that hype merchants say it does. But copywriting does do damage. It massively reduces both the reach and social benefit of artists' work. The groundbreaking research of Dr. Peter Eckersley, a native Melbourneian, has measured what is called the cost of artificial scarcity. Copyright makes works of art artificially scarce. So if you let one person hear the music, but 10 other people can't listen to it, perhaps because they can't afford to buy it, then in fact there's a social cost. There's also a cost to the artist because fewer people listen to their work. Dr. Eckersley research shows that if music sharing, pirating, was completely legalized, the value and enjoyment of a typical piece of music would double. Imagine that. But moreover, if piracy in the music industry stopped entirely today, the enjoyment produced by a typical piece of music would fall by about a third. So quite substantially. That, thus, piracy can actually be beneficial to society. Now to my third argument. Copyright kills creativity. Creativity is often iterative. It frequently transforms an earlier work. Could Radiohead have existed without the influence of Pink Floyd? Could the Hilltop Hoods have existed without African-American hip-hop bands? No. It's these references that make things like hip-hop what it is. It's what makes it creative. All these artists are pirates of sorts. They borrow, steal, change, improve what's come before. Yet many creators in this era of remixing, sampling, mashups, and collage art are actually discovering that copyright makes their art forms effectively illegal. If you are an independent musician who wants to make sample-based music in Australia, it's almost impossible to do so legally, and that's because of copyright. This leads to my final argument. In the copyright world, we are all criminals. The copyright police have turned our free society into a police state. In 2012, a nine-year-old girl in Finland had her laptop seized, and a court case started against her for downloading pirating material. That's just madness. Someone wanted to write a, a, a book about the eighth dwarf, and the publisher told the author, sorry, you have to get permission from Disney first. And this is despite the fact that this story of Snow White and the Seven Dwarves is actually an old European fable from 1812, not a modern California creation. Such is the fear of the copyright police. It makes me nervous calling my doctor doc and my child sleepy. <laughs> copyright has caused us to build insane counterproductive technologies to prevent people from being able to copy things. Have you ever wondered why you can't play a DVD you bought in one place? place in a DVD player from another? Have you ever had weird problems with video cables from one device being unwilling to talk to another device? These problems are often the result of deliberate and expensive attempts to prevent technology from working because some Hollywood executive flipped out about piracy. The cost to our economy of building and then suffering with this technology is in the billions of dollars. And imagine how many great works of art that money could finance. In conclusion, our younger generation knows these things. They have twigged that copyright is now being used as a means of control, of fear. But it is gross overreach. It is over-controlling. It is failing because it's inefficient, just like the old USSR. So it is collapsing. Either we all become felons, or the system of copyright becomes so ridiculous that it fails. Generation Y has become sick of being felons, and that means copyright is destined to fail. In the information age, those who favor copyright believe we should live in a world where all information is subject to grubby intellectual property grabs. In their copyrighted world, your words and ideas and creative output will belong to someone. It just won't be you. That is why copyright is dead. Long live the pirates. Michael Fraser. Michael Williams, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues. <clears throat> Copyright is a human right, guaranteed by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. 
Article 27.2 states that everyone has the right to the protection of the moral and material interests resulting from any scientific, literary or artistic production of which he is the author. An author, an artist, a creator has the moral right to respect for their work and the material right to be paid for their work. Writers, artists, creators have the right to earn a living from their creative work. Recognition of the inalienable rights of all people is the foundation of freedom, justice and peace. So it's essential that human rights, including copyright, are protected by the rule of law and respected and observed by the people of member states of the United Nations. The World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO, was established in 1967 as a United Nations agency. It is dedicated to protecting this right and to improve understanding and respect for intellectual property worldwide. The current Director General of WIPO is an Australian, Francis Gurry. Its mission is to promote the use of intellectual property, including copyright and patents, as a means of stimulating innovation and creativity for the economic, social and cultural development of all nations through a balanced and effective international intellectual property system. Its motto is respect copyright, encourage creativity. WIPO administers 25 international intellectual property treaties, including the Berne Convention for the Protection of Literary and Artistic Works of 1886. Australia is one of 167 nations and territories that have acceded to the Berne Convention, and all member nations of the World Trade Organization have agreed to implement the standards of the Berne Convention in their own copyright laws. Article 9 of the Berne Convention says, authors of literary and artistic works protected by this convention shall have the exclusive right of authorizing the reproduction of these works in any manner or form. The Convention allows member countries to make exceptions in their copyright laws only in certain special cases that do not conflict with a normal exploitation of the work and do not unreasonably prejudice the legitimate interests of the author. And so our Australian Copyright Act says that the author of a literary, dramatic, musical or artistic work is the owner of any copyright subsisting in the work. And exceptions to the author's right are limited to special cases like fair dealing for research and study and exceptions for libraries and schools. Everyone agrees with these limited exceptions. They are special cases in the public interest. Copyright is essential to the life of our society. Copyright is a foundation of freedom of expression. Without copyright, there is no freedom of expression. And if we don't have freedom of expression, we can't be a democracy. Copyright is necessary for freedom of expression because it means that authors, creators, can make a living directly from their work. They can sell copies and online access. When a creator can support herself by her own work, she can survive by working independently and express her own views, her unique vision to the world. When a creator cannot live by her work, she is silenced. Without copyright, she is silenced. A creator who is silenced is imprisoned. Of course, there are some other ways that creators can put bread on the table. They can make an income as employed creators, employed by a corporation or government department. They can attach advertisements to their work or use their work as an ad. 
Some creators get grants and prizes for their work from the state or the church or from wealthy corporations and foundations. These are other ways for an author or artist to get an income without copyright. But all these other ways all depend on patronage and support by the wealthy and powerful, and they support what is in their interests. If we want freedom of expression, there must be a space for individual, independent creators and producers to make a living so that they can go on working and producing their own original creative work for us. We need copyright so that creators have a secure market where they can sell copies of their work, physical and digital copies. If people are interested and buy copies, the independent creators and producers can make a living and continue working. They can go on, dedicated to creating their own original work for us. Without copyright, independent, professional creative work is unsustainable. Without copyright, the diversity and the range of expression in our society would be limited to work that is supported by patronage and amateur work. Without copyright, we do not have full freedom of expression. That is why totalitarian and fascist regimes don't recognize copyright. They don't let independent creators support themselves in the market by earning money from their own copyrights. They like to decide who gets to be an author. Without copyright, there is no freedom of expression. Copyright is a pillar of our society. We are a society of laws. In our society, we respect the right to have property. Real property, your house or your apartment, personal property, your watch, your vehicle. And there is intellectual property, which protects works of the mind. Copyright is a property right. A creator's work may have cultural or aesthetic value, but it is copyright law that gives economic value to their work. It is the creator's right to decide to sell copies of their work or give it away. It is not the consumer's choice. The consumer is not entitled just to copy it. That right belongs to the person who made it. The creator deserves respect for her work and for the value of her work, just like anyone else. Copyright protection gives creative people the confidence and incentive to invest their time, their talent, and their work, and copyright gives publishers and producers the incentive to invest their capital into making quality, professional, creative content for sale, because they can get a reward for their work. Of course, creators and publishers and producers love their work, but we should not ask too much of love. Copyright works are the most valuable commodity in the world today. Trade in our copyright cultural, education, information, knowledge, and entertainment products and services online is the greatest opportunity for Australia since Merino sheep. At the moment, the world is telling us to shut up and keep digging. The Chinese love our rocks. We dig them up and ship them out. But what will we do when we have dug up all our rocks and shipped them to China? With strong and secure copyright to drive innovation and support the market for original creative work, I back Australians' creativity and imagination and our creative industries to generate our prosperity in the 21st century information society and beyond. That will happen if we respect and value works of the mind. Let's build up our culture and a creative economy. We are creative people. Let us respect our own creativity and respect the creative work of others. Let's agree to get permission when we copy. So long as copyright lives, individual freedom of expression can live. While freedom of expression lives, our democratic society can live and grow. Simon Groth.
Good evening. So my last involvement in a public debate was in 1989. And even I admit that my year nine debating team was a pretty sorry bunch of misfits. We only won one debate the entire year, and I attribute that win to an amazingly prescient quote from John Lennon that I made up on the spot. <laughs> so fair warning to my esteemed colleagues uh, across the bench at the, the heritage of debating prowess on display for our second speaker. I wanted to add the point of view of someone, uh, a point of view that's informed not only by my experiences as someone whose writing has appeared in print since around 2000 and online since about 1995, but also as someone who reads, who browses, who downloads, and who still has a heaving shelf of print books. So let's break this down. Is copyright dead? In my day job, I explore the future of the book and so I maintain a healthy skepticism towards premature declarations of death. Since 1894, when Octave Uzan published possibly the first of innumerable hyperbolic elegies, the book has been declared dead, dying, on life support, or simply off in a huff somewhere and uncontactable for the time being. Death is attention grabbing and dramatic, but it's also kind of nihilistic. It's a collective shrug and an admission that we're out of ideas. It's a pretty sorry state of affairs. And sometimes what looks like death is actually kind of something else. And anyway, does the real or perceived demise of copyright automatically lead to a victory for pirates? What is piracy anyway? Maybe it's like porn. You know it when you see it. Dodgy DVDRs for, for sale at the local flea market. Yeah, it's, it's pretty clearly piracy. Is unauthorised copying via the internet the same thing? Or is it something different? If there's wrongdoing in copying, then where is its locus? In the access to the content? In the replication of the data? Or in the, in the consumption of its content? OK, so turning back the dial on the polemic a little bit. We arrive at the notion that something deep within our existing concept of copyright, as we understand it and apply it today, is in a bit of trouble. Regardless of how it was initially conceived and for whom it was initially intended to benefit, which I might add was, you know, copyright was an invention of the print age. Modern copyright has evolved into a mechanism that's intended to allow authors to benefit from original works by granting them control for a period of time. It should mean that creators of original work can expect fair compensation and acknowledgement when their work is bought and sold, adapted, referenced, and so on. So of course copyright is about more than just a set of rules governing, how, uh, governing the ability to make copies of a given work. But here's the thing, to my mind, the notion of the copy is absolutely central to the disruption of traditional copyright at the hands of digital media. So copyright was created with the medium of print in mind. It's an invention of the print age. To create a print copy of an existing work takes dedication, resources, time, and money. Copyright is an, effect an effective system in the physical world because for an audience, the path of least resistance to obtaining a creative work is to buy it or borrow it, but we won't go into that can of worms. Even with modern home stand, scanning and printing technology, no one wants to go through the interminable process of copying anything, be it freedom or Fifty Shades, or Fifty Shades of Freedom, whatever floats your boat. The payoff is not worth the effort. Not when the local bookshop has good coffee and Amazon has a buy it now button. Under a system predicated on physical objects, readers buy books and some of that money reaches authors. Now, as Suleta has pointed out, it's anything but perfect, but eh, it kind of does the job. Things are very, very different in a networked world of ones and zeros. Consider this. Although it's most certainly not a series of tubes, the internet is an excellent system for copying content. That's part of its design. To view a single page of web content, a reader requests data from a remote server. The information is carved up into tiny little packets, which wind their way through the network 
to reach the reader's computer where everything is reassembled into something intelligible, or a lolcat. Along the way, each packet of data passes through a series of routers, computers whose job it is not only to direct internet traffic, but to copy everything that passes through them. Though such copies are not held in perpetuity and they represent only a fraction of something meaningful, th th these are copies. This is copying that happens. When the transmitted data is then reassembled as content on the viewer's screen, the web browser automatically copies information from that page to a local cache on your device. The cache holds that information in the event that you will want to go back to that site. When you load the front page of the New York Times, unless it's your very first visit, you are compiling it from data stored locally on your device alongside new stuff. OK, one more example. I'm sure we've all sent an email attachment, right? So let's count the number of copies of a file, complete copies of a file, created in that most humble of tasks. You open a message and drag the file to your message window, where a copy is stored in your messages system. You hit send, and the file is stored to your IMAP server. It's then sent through the tubes to the receiver's end, which is then downloaded onto their email client, which they may then save to a specific location in their own hard drive. And that doesn't take into account the fact that many of us access email on a number of devices. Each device needs a new copy. Nor does it acknowledge that devices are, or at least should be, backed up regularly. More copies. So in the transfer of one file from one person to another person, a bloom of copies results, sometimes across the world. Copying is essential to a functioning internet, a fact which feeds into a fundamental feature of digital media that began long before even personal computing. Today, making a copy of any given set of data is not just easy, it's as natural and as un unconscious as breathing. In such an environment, the trading of unauthorized copies within the audience has become just as natural. And this, for me, at least, is the essence of copyright's digital disruption. In this environment, making a copy has become the path of least resistance. I recently had a really spirited discussion with a member of the, the board of the Copyright Agency. Um, who felt that existing copyright law was flexible and adaptable enough to, to protect rights holders in both the physical and digital world. Now, we agreed on a lot of things, but this seemed to be the point on which we fundamentally diverged. You cannot pick up a set of rules that govern property in the physical world and dump them, stretch them, squash them, grind them into a digital environment. This is the kind of thinking that results in the overreach of rights holders and Sulet has already mentioned some of these. Placing artificial geo blocks on content. Placing punitive restrictions on how content can be stored and accessed. Restrictions that have no parallel in the physical world. Treating an audience as criminals first and as readers, listeners or fans second. Audiences are not dumb. They know there's a difference between shoplifting and unauthorised copying. Even if they accept that both of these things are wrong, and many do not. They know that digital media is fundamentally different to physical media. And although there's not a, love, a lot of love for copyright holders, the broad community regularly expresses support for artists, authors, and other creative people. The question of whether copyright is drowning or waving is beside the point. Traditional copyright never had a chance in the digital world. And maybe it's time we stop pretending that things haven't changed. Part of my job, and it's a, it's a part that I take seriously, is exploring how readers and writers find each other. Ideas that I hope will inspire and fuel sustainable connections into the future. It's exciting work, but sometimes it's a little unclear what success looks like. But I take heart from the words of John Lennon, <laughs> who said that piracy is the unauthorised spreading of media, where the creator may lose cultural control but gain cultural value. OK, that was actually Henry Jenkins. But his point is a salient one. Our starting point is to change the way we think about how content travels. Thank you. Laurie Fletcher. Um, good evening. Thank you for letting me speak to you tonight about why the reports about the death of copyright have been much exaggerated and why there should be no celebration of the pirates who are largely responsible for its ill health. 
starting a little behind the eight ball, if the Twitter feed that I've been reading is correct, it's going to be jokes rather than logic that might leverage votes tonight. And this is a subject I take fairly seriously, having made my living for 20 years from making and selling content. An alarming report was released last week estimating that in January of this year, 432 million people used the internet to access, to access copyright infringing material in January. Nearly a quarter of all internet traffic can be attributed to piracy in spite of the growth of legal channels for accessing entertainment online. Copyright's not yet dead, but it's not looking very healthy. For the past five years, IPAF, the Intellectual Property Awareness Foundation, has undertaken independent research into the attitudes and behaviours of Australians in regard to, to piracy. We do this to inform the debate, like these, and to dispel some of the myths and preconceptions that exist around this issue. The research is done via anonymous online polls through news poll, where participants can be truthful through anonymity. Our most recent research was in June this year, and I want to share with you the three key reasons that pirates give for their online activities. If these were true, I would concede right now that, pir that piracy, that copyright is dead. Happily, our research lays bare some statistical truths and shatters some preconceptions. The first one is that everyone does it, or it's as natural as breathing, Simon says. Simon says, I want that noted as humor. Um, <laughs> that'll be it, pretty much. One of the research participants said that it's acceptable because every man and his dog out there is doing it, plain and simple. Why should I be the sucker that has to pay for what everyone else is getting for free, said another. In fact, the research shows that 75% of Australians over the age of 18 do not illegally download content online. 75%, that's a really important statistic. The idea that everyone is doing it simply legitimizes the behavior. Piracy see, people see piracy as the social norm. These Australian stats are not an anomaly. They reflect those of many other international studies, including the UK and other European territories. The majority of the population respect and uphold copyright. Piracy is not the dominant behavior. It's still the behavior of a very noisy minority. However, that doesn't mean that there's not a problem. One in four adults are regularly downloading and streaming pirated movies and TV programs. Can you imagine your own business surviving if one out of four of your clients or customers wasn't paying for your goods or services? Let's look at another of the prevailing myths about piracy that the IPAF research challenges. There's no other way to get content. Many of the online research comments about piracy suggest that people would like to pay, but are not given the opportunity to do so. However, more than 70 percent of both 12 to 17 year olds and over 18 year olds in Australia acknowledge in the IPAF research that there are an increasing number of legal options available. Comparisons of our 2012 and 2013 data show that illegal behavior amongst Australian adults remains static. It's true that the downward trend of traditional viewing of film and TV continues. But legal access to online content is statistically significantly up. The number of adults who would choose a paid online version over the free pirated version increased from 36% last year to 54% this year. It's really important to emphasize that the IPAF research year on year, and we've run it for five years now, confirms that the vast majority of people download content because it's free, not for any of the other reasons that are often given as rationalizations and excuses, simply because it's free. Why pay when you can get it for nothing was the catch cry from several of the research respondents. Another said, for me personally, money pretty much above all is what controls my decisions. When infringing sites are shut down or blocked, legitimate purchases increase as happened in 2012 with the international blocking of super site Mega Upload, leading to a healthy uptake of legal content access. 
Over 70% of the IPAV research respondents would cease to pirate if their ISP threatened to suspend or slow their internet access. Legislation allowing content owners to obtain court orders blocking access to illegal websites that solely profit from pirated content is now present in over 15 countries, including Denmark, France, Germany, Ireland, Italy, Spain, and the UK. Although it's early days, the indications are that this is having a really positive effect on legitimate sales. And who would have believed that anyone could build paywalls around news after so many years of getting news for free? But last week, News Limited reported that annual revenue had grown due to a rise in subscription revenue. Copyright is alive and kicking back. Let's move on to the third reason given for why freeloading online content is okay, and another illustration that copyright is not yet in intensive care, but breathing on its own, expected to make a full recovery. Distribution models are archaic, and the people who make films and television programs are too rich. A quote from a research participant says, I think good on the people who know how to watch free movies or TV shows. I believe stars get paid way too much, so do not see why we have to pay for it. It's very clear from our research that the public either do not or choose not to understand that the victims of piracy are not simply studio executives, music companies, and high-profile actors and musicians. Blaming the business model is a lame justification, particularly while expressing reluctance to enrich the industry mandarins and overpaid celebrities, a little disingenuous in the face of the obscene profits being made by people who have nothing to do with the creation of the content. Only yesterday, Foxtel unveiled its subscription movie streaming service with a monthly all-you-can-watch fee, another obstacle to the pirates' argument about the lack of services in Australia. There's no doubt that content creators and internet service providers share a responsibility in providing reasonable, legitimate avenues for people to access their content legally. Similarly, changes to legislation must respond to how we access content in this digital age and will also play an important role in changing the nature of this debate. However, the expectation of getting something for nothing should not be an acceptable byproduct of the internet. Notwithstanding the attempts to devalue content and promote the philosophy of piracy, copyright is not yet dead, despite what my learned opponents might tell you. Remember, 75% of Australians are accessing legal, only legal content online. We also know for certain that copyright is not dead because in 2010, 2011, over 900,000 people were employed in the copyright industries, representing 8% of the Australian workforce. Copyright industries generated an economic value of $93.2 billion, the equivalent of 6.6% .6 of gross domestic product. And the copyright industries generated just over $7 billion in exports. Not bad for a dead industry. World-renowned filmmaker and public figure Lord David Putnam advocates we should as a society become more focused on the idea of digital citizenship. He argues that while there's wide discussion about the freedoms desired by those who use the internet, there's scant debate about what sort of responsibilities one should take when going online. If we don't defend the value of creative content, it will be difficult, if not impossible, to establish a cost for content. So my team and I are here tonight just doing that, defending the value of creative content. If we prematurely bury the concept of copyright and celebrate the freedom of piracy without reference to rights, responsibility, legitimate revenue to the copyright holders, we will have done all creative industries and the hundreds and thousands of talented and dedicated creative artists a great disservice. And for those of you who love content, you may have loved it to death. Thank you. Angela Daly. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed colleagues, 
As the third and final speaker for the proposition, and as a lawyer of sorts, an academic and activist one anyway, I thought I would focus specifically on the legal as aspect of this issue, by which I mean how copyright laws come into being and operate in practice. In fact, it is my contention that these very processes of how the law is formed, enforced, and as it turns out, disobeyed, are the nails in copyright's coffin. Indeed, it's the flawed and undemocratic ways in which these processes are happening that are turning people to piracy and letting the pirates win. So firstly, turning to the formation stage of copyright law, Recent sources of changes to our copyright laws in Australia have mainly come from international treaties, whether those specifically about copyright, such as the WIPO Copyright Treaty, or trade treaties such as the Australia-US Free Trade Agreement. However, the problem with copyright law originating in such treaties is that these treaties are often negotiated in secret and, on their conclusion, presented to the general public and parliament as a done deal. A case in point is the Trans-Pacific Partnership, currently under negotiation between Australia and various other countries around the Pacific Rim, including the US. The Trans-Pacific Partnership includes a chapter on intellectual property with provisions on copyright and is also being negotiated in secret. The general public and even parliament do not know its precise content. However, Corporate lobbyists, such as the Motion Picture Association of America, have had privileged access to drafts of the text, while consumer groups have effectively been locked out. As a result of processes such as these, perhaps unsurprisingly, we end up with copyright laws that reflect the interests of big corporations, rather than the interests of normal Australians, such as the extension of the scope of copyright and the increased length of copyright terms. These kind of restrictions are definitely not in the best interests of Australians, especially since Australia is actually a net importer of intellectual property, according to statistics from the Australian Intellectual Property Report 2013. This kind of law formation through the back door of treaties can represent what is known as policy laundering. This means pushing through unpopular laws that may not withstand democratic scrutiny in extra-parliamentary ways such as treaties. In the context of trade agreements as well, laws on something like copyright might be presented as a trade-off for something else that would seem completely unrelated otherwise, such as, for instance, Australian agricultural products being allowed to enter the US market. However, in any event, the overall benefits to Australia of free trade agreements with the US have been somewhat dubious. Specifically on the issue of copyrighted content and software, they have not stopped rights holders, often US-based, from charging Australians a huge amount more for content and software compared to their American counterparts, as we have seen in the Australian Parliament's IT pricing report released earlier this year. So the formation of copyright law these days often takes place via these somewhat unaccountable and untransparent means, where it seems that corporations know much more about what's going on than members of the Australian Parliament. It's no wonder that the law it produces is favourable to these corporate actors and that it doesn't garner much legitimacy in the eyes of the general public. But it's not just, copyright, it's not just how copyright law comes into being where corporations have had a hand. Corporate lobbying has also influenced how copyright law is enforced. In some countries such as the UK, due to this corporate pr pressure, websites and peer-to-peer -peer file sharing services accused of facilitating copyright infringement have been blocked by internet service providers. This is even though that many of these websites and peer-to-peer -peer services have at least a dual purpose of facilitating infringing and non-infringing uses. Although I've not come across examples of this so far in Australia, and despite the best efforts of big content to hold internet service provider IINet here liable for its users' behaviour, Section 313 of the Telecommunications Act, which states that carriers must do their best to prevent their networks and facilities from being used to commit offences, could potentially be used here in the name of copyright enforcement. 
This somewhat obscure provision of law only came to prominence after it was used earlier this year to block over a thousand mainly innocuous websites, including that of the Melbourne Free University. As it stands, no court order or other judicial oversight is required before this law is used. In the name of copyright enforcement too, we are seeing increased mass surveillance of internet users carried out by internet service providers and cloud operators, including monitoring users who are acting totally legally, presumably on the off chance that they might possibly be caught infringing copyright at some indeterminable point. Apparently there are plans to implement a scheme like this in Australia via what we have seen from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, in spite of the Australian Federal Government ab abandoning a similar mass filtering and surveillance scheme last year. We have also seen the mega upload fiasco in New Zealand, which has turned out to be an example of illegal overreach by law enforcement agencies there in the name of copyright enforcement. This saga has included the New Zealand anti-terrorism police being sent to raid Kim.com's property, which seems to me at least to be a somewhat over-the-top reaction, as well as the New Zealand law enforcement agencies being found to have acted illegally in conducting the raid and sending material out of the country to the FBI. In any event, for the general public, there is very little information about what all of these surveillance and law enforcement measures actually cost, the extent to which they are successful in policing copyright, and what the overall benefits of them to society actually are. To me, anyway, it seems that a huge amount of resources are being directed to policing copyright. I think we have to ask ourselves, as a society, whether this is really the best use of these resources and whether copyright is really the most important area of law to attempt to enforce. The third and final point about the law I want to make is this one. Maybe the underlying problem with all of this is just that the law does not really reflect social practice and norms, basically what people are doing in reality. In practice too, copyright in the digital realm cannot fully be enforced, as pirates have proved one step ahead technologically. I don't think there is any technical protection measure or digital rights management initiative created to protect copyright that has not been successfully hacked and broken. So as a result, there is a big gap between the law in the books and the enforcement of that law in the digital reality. Also, copyright law and enforcement tries to prevent the widespread and very much normalised social practice of people sharing stuff with each other. In fact, I just read this morning that the US Centre for Copyright Information, a partnership between various industry bodies and five large ISPs in the States, is introducing a problem of programme of copyright education, or perhaps could be seen as indoctrination, in primary schools in California, presumably to get to people while they're young, since their research among adults, in the US anyway, has showed that most consumers simply don't understand or appreciate copyright. It seems just not to fit with their view of the world and how things work. The corporate infiltration of copyright law formation and enforcement as well means that people just don't really feel that bad about not paying for content. As we know here in Australia, prices are high and the popular perception at least is that not enough of this money is actually going to the original creators. And so, ladies and gentlemen, and right on time, in concluding, I would like to leave you with one simple message as to why copyright is dead and why the pirates are winning. Namely, it's the law, stupid. <laughs> it's the law whose formation is done in a way that panders to copyright rights holders and their lobbying dollars and bypasses democratic oversight. It's the law that goes way beyond what is protected by copyright and is dangerously over the top in heading towards a state of super surveillance. It's the law too that doesn't reflect what's happening in reality with technology and with what people are actually doing with digital content. The lack of legitimacy of the law, as well as its practical unenforceability, coupled with mass disobedience by literally millions of people, mean that whether we like it or not, the system sucks and the pirates are winning. Elmo Keep. Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed colleagues, always wanted to say that. 
Um, quickly to the point of Radiohead, speaking as a music writer, fair question, would they exist without radio, uh, without Nirvana? Uh, although influence and appropriation are cultural practices, they're not infringing on copyright. Uh, Tom York of Radiohead has publicly said that giving in rainbows away is one of the biggest regrets of his career because it taught people that music was worth nothing. And he has publicly removed the rest of his band's music from Spotify, similarly saying this is robbing artists of an ability to make a living, particularly young artists. So we can talk about Nirvana, and if or not, they're the world's most overrated band later. So I will be today attempting to answer no less than the million dollar question listed on the website. We'll be accepting my check later. How do we ensure that creativity continues to pay? Um, just quickly, I'm the author with a, I am an author with a publishing house. I'm a writer who works in print and online, who has produced television, written television, has overseen the digital distribution channels for that television, and I am the digital director with a non-profit literary magazine, which has just transitioned transition to subcompact digital format, The Lifted Brow. So this is right in my wheelhouse. To start, let's zoom out a little and imagine the world without copyright. All things are free. So royalties aren't paid, permissions aren't paid, advances aren't paid to authors because no one buys books anymore as they are now free. No one pays for television shows so advertisers don't take out ads in the middle of them so no money and no new shows. No one buys music from record labels and record labels, not that they exist in this future, don't invest in artists so there is no new music. Movies are free somehow despite how vastly expensive they are to make. And so you can see where the flaw in this vision is. If there's no revenue generated in these fields because the goods are free, then how will these goods, which are actually cultural artifacts, be created in the first place? They won't be. Because culture is not free. To even say that it is possible to create something from nothing is a, is a proposition so ludicrous it actually defies physics. It costs money to make money. To create anything takes time. If you don't value your time in labor costs that you are owed to be paid, then you are either an amateur, an anarchist, or a fool. Information wants to be free, we so often hear without hearing the second part of that quote, which is, information also wants to be expensive. That tension will not go away. How can creativity continue to pay? First, let's look at who did benefit from the first wave of piracy when Napster emerged in the late 1990s from the bedroom of an American teenager. In the 15 years since its emergence, the global record industry's profits have halved. Piracy meant that music was suddenly worthless. It was, in consumers' eyes, worth literally no financial transaction whatsoever. The baseline was lowered to free. When Apple decided to open its iTunes music store in order to boost sales of its iPod hardware, Steve Jobs set the price of a single song at 99 cents. 99 cents was attractive. It's a small price to pay. Compared to zero, it is not a huge leap. What this did, once Apple asserted market dominance over digital music, was to drastically devalue all digital goods. Apple can afford to do this because MP3s are a loss-leading product for them. Apple is not in the business of selling MP3s. It is in the business of selling the vastly more expensive hardware upon which those MP3s are played. Apple sets very punitive sales terms with labels and networks that sell through its store. It sets the price that your content will be available at, and there is no negotiating that price. You either agree to their terms or you don't sell through their store. Apple then takes its 30%. It has provided nothing more than a server for people to, serve their, to sell their wares through, yet it has profited enormously from making those wares so cheap that no competitor can viably emerge. Digital goods stay cheap. Apple's market cap is hovering at around 500 billion US dollars. The money it has reinvested in the creative industries is zero. Similarly, Amazon sells a loss-leading product in ebooks. Ebooks are vastly undervalued, as anyone who gets an email alerting them to an entire back catalog at $1.99 a book can attest. Amazon is not in the business of selling ebooks, it is in the business of selling Kindle e-readers, crushing its competition through rock bottom pricing and free shipping, that being brick and mortar stores and other online retailers who cannot compete with it. Amazon's sale conditions are as punitive as Apple's and just as mercurial. And recently, Amazon CEO just bought the Washington Post newspaper for $250 million in his own cash. Neither of these monolithic, multi-billion dollar companies could exist at their dominance today without the devalued digital goods made of other people's intellectual property on top of which they stand. How can creativity continue to pay in the age of piracy and free culture? 
It is a two-step process that begins with changing consumer perceptions. As consumers, we have to accept that this is actually wrong. We have to accept that $2.99 for a book or $3.99 for an hour of scripted television is too cheap, that 99 cents is really not enough for a song, that digital goods may be in some ways more ephemeral than physical objects, the cost in labour time, in serving them, hosting them, digitising them, promoting them, to the human beings who created them, who wrote them, who composed them, who filmed them, edited them, acted in them, is the same. And to think just a little into the future and to do some very basic maths. Digital goods have already eclipsed the sale of physical ones. As they are soon to be the dominant vessel of all cultural goods, the corrosive cumulative effect of their devaluation is obvious even to someone with such a tenuous grasp on maths as a writer such as myself. These things are really, really cheap. They're soon to be all that there is. They generate far less revenue. It's very simple. Yet through the architecture of the internet, our behaviours have been primed to the point where we want what we want and we want it immediately and if it's too expensive or not available right now, then we're just going to take it. This is an immoral stance. Piracy is theft. To download a file is to make a copy of it. Goods are not just... Cultural goods cannot be reduced to ones and zeros. It's copyright infringement. There are many cognitive tricks that you can play to convince yourself that what you're doing is fine that it's justified. It's a victimless crime, everyone does it. But you can see with not much difficulty that that is the thinking which enables the cycle in the first place, which in turn enables the devaluation of digital goods to continue unchallenged, because still in people's minds, they equate digital with cheap, with ephemeral, with worthless, with free. The first step is to realise that this assumption is false and to make the ethically sound decision in your own life to pay for whatever you consume through whichever legal means are available. The problem with those legal means currently being too cheap is what I will come to now. For the creative industries to recover from the disruptive chaos wrought upon them by free culture evangelists and the companies which profited from their mindset, creators need to take their content back from these third-party tech giants and sell it straight to audiences themselves. There is so far one light on the hill, and that is Netflix, a web-based production company, creates its own content and sells it straight to its subscribers, and there is no middleman. But for smaller players to be able to do this, to recreate those structures, think what they're going to need, a very large injection of capital. We are going to have to pay more because most creators are not giants like Apple and Amazon who can operate at a loss on goods and reap giant profit elsewhere. Small players' intellectual property is no loss leader. It is the entirety of their business. Copyright does not stifle creativity. Copyright and creativity have fruitfully coexisted for over 300 years, and I would defy anyone who argues that creativity has somehow suffered in that time or been prevented from flourishing to look around you in the world. It's everywhere. What does stifle creativity is an inability to make a living from it. Increasingly, this is the most difficult time to be an artist, precisely because revenues in the digital age are shrinking to minuscule, and we have the free culture movement to thank for that. The free ride is over. If we don't come to accept that and make personal decisions to consume ethically, then someone is always going to be getting rich somewhere. Make sure that it's not you lining the pockets of billionaires with your lazy habits of consumption. Think of where your money is going and what kind of world you want to live in, where profits and power continue to be concentrated in the hands of the very, very few for our convenience, or where we pay more for what art is actually worth so that art can continue to be made. I want to be in a world where artists' rights are respected and continue to be enshrined by copyright law. That is how we fuel innovation, by protecting the abilities for artists to make a living. In the end, I think you'll find that we're the ones who need to think different. And I'll ask you to continue your applause for a moment for for the uh, moment more for the panel because that was terrific. So that concludes the initial formal presentation part of tonight's proceedings, and now we throw it open to the floor debate. Uh, I'd ask you to keep any contribution you make to a minute. It can be a statement rather than a, a question. This is your chance to contribute to the debate as it's happened so far. We're going to start over uh, on this side of the house. Uh, hey, uh, I, I turned my phone off before I came in here, but uh, I know that there's some statistic about how um, 
most people who employ piracy actually end up paying for the product after they've illegally downloaded it. I don't know if anybody has got that statistic, but I guess I just wanted to follow up with the, with the question, if Apple and Amazon are treating artists so badly, what's the incentive for ordinary people to, to pay them for uh, the, the legally acknowledged, copyrighted, whatever it was, material? And uh, yeah, that was, I guess, my question. I am going to take that as a question, particularly for the negative side of the panel, if any of you want to take that up. I'll take the first part of it. It's absolutely not true that people who uh, pirate any content actually pay for it. Some people say that they do. They use it. They, in fact, a lot of people like to use it as an excuse for they're actually marketing the films. Uh, Carnegie Mellon University did a study a few months ago. They looked at all of the previous studies around this. Um, I think there were something like 18 previous studies, um, most of which had concluded that there was absolutely no um, truth in the fact that. Uh, Piracy helped sales, and Carnegie Mellon looked at the studies that said it did and found that they had some flawed arguments. Now, I know, and again, looking at Twitter, a lot of people are very skeptical about research. Yes, research is always paid for some by someone, but there are research methodologies that are obviously more sound than others. The interpretation is always what, you know, what, what one has to look out for. But a statistic is a statistic, particularly when it comes through an online um, independent research company like NewsPoll um, or other independent universities. So um, I would say there's absolutely no truth to that statistic. Um, you might oh, okay. the so, second part. Um, you know, I'm arguing that your money should not go to Amazon and Apple. Your money should go to direct to artists whenever possible. You should buy straight from publishers through their websites whenever possible. You should buy from bands straight from their websites whenever possible. Because those giant conglomerates are just becoming bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and they absolutely own those two markets. That's terrible. So. The fact that there's all of these ways for artists to be able to direct, connect with their audience doesn't always translate to them selling 400,000 copies of a book about hackers that's obviously going to go massive on the internet because that's where that audience is. So you really have to think about your consumption habits and how you can change them and think more about where your money will end up. We'll take a question from this side. Are you uh, speaking for the affirmative or the negative? I'm sort of speaking split across both affirmative and negative. I'd like to address both teams if I could. Um, do you feel that copyright provides an important infrastructure around which more permissive systems uh, are allowed to function, uh, specifically systems such as the Creative Commons um, licensing system, which does provide for uh, mainly freedom of distribution without penalty, but also allows creators to restrict uh, their work in terms of uh, other people, uh, excuse me, uh, other people uh, changing their works, modifying it, um, or uh, modifying other ways that they may not uh, permit. So the question really is, um, is copyright still valuable, um, but does it need to change in the way that it functions in the modern age? I would think that that's, that's really central to the, the argument that I was putting forward, really. Um, that in a digital world, the underlying assumptions behind copyright don't necessarily apply. And I think uh, a system like Creative Commons is one of the ways, it's, it's pointing a way forward for artists and, uh, and consumers to decide uh, on it clearly delineate how the artist would like the work to be used um, in a way that's, that's very clear, not just to, to other artists, to publishers, but to the consumers of the work as well. Can I just clarify? Sorry. Okay, so, um, our side is saying that copyright, as we see it today, is dead which is to say that were it to be in a, 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 different, a different animal, um, then you know, that might be a different story. But as it is today, it's dead. I'll speak to that one, Michael. The, you ask if the copyright system provides an architecture for something like Creative Commons, and of course it does. Creative Commons is a copyright licensing system. It's a licensing system where the creator 
chooses to set the value of their work at naught and to make it available for free, our argument is that that is the creator's choice. It's not the consumer's choice. And so that allows, it's an effective system for licensing your copyright and letting everybody know that you want it to be available for free. That is based on copyright. The, the only reservation I have about Creative Commons is that uh, up and coming creators need to understand that uh, if later they um, make it big, they can't get back the rights that they've given away for free. But if you understand that and you're happy to license your works for free, then that is absolutely a copyright licensing system and it's fully justified. But it's not the consumer's choice, it's the creator's choice. I'll go back over here. Uh, yes, my, I'm going to sort of go down the middle and, and ask a question in, in many ways of either side. Uh, while I agree fairly completely with Michael's characterization of copyright in its sort of conceptual underpinnings. I also find that I agree fairly much wholeheartedly with Angela's uh, comment that in implementation it largely sucks. Uh, and this was uh, raised recently by Kevin Spacey in Edinburgh and he was addressing the issues uh, confronting the television industry which goes something to what Elmo was saying and uh, I just think there's a sort of elephant in the room here that copyright is in concept about ensuring that artists get paid. It has to a large extent been hijacked and I think ask, you know, suggesting that Apple is the, uh, the bad guy or that um, Google or Amazon are the bad guys, you know, they're just swapping one distribution mechanism for another. So we need to look at much as the, the sort of distribution and the way those laws have been hijacked, I think. You know, piracy is an offshoot of artificial scarcity applied by these organisations that control the mode of distribution. We'll take one from over this side now. Uh, hi. Um, my name is Callum. Thank you very much for your contributions this evening. Um, uh, look, I've got a question that I suppose relates to values um, and how they should be applied in this instance. Uh, I'm a product manager for a technology company and one of the challenges that I think every business in the world is facing right at this moment is how they're going to deal with the explosion of information. Um, information that is largely in the form of content um, and I think perhaps the most important part of the challenge that these businesses face is they don't know what to do with it. There is so much information that is being created at such a rate that they really can't get their heads around it. They can't control it in the way they, they used to. Uh, what I have seen in perhaps the, some of the world's most innovative organisations is a tendency to embrace the change as a means of overcoming the doubt and uncertainty. Um, and typically innovative organisations are leading this through, um, through empowering employees with values is the piracy debate very much in the same league? Uh, aren't we trying to restrict something which isn't even valid any longer? Thank you. I'm going to take a couple more from the floor before I bring it back to uh, our panellists, just to make sure that we get as many contributions from the floor as possible. So thank you. And I'll throw over here on my left. Hello, my name is Eliza. Um, my comment is to whoever wants to answer this on both sides. Um, I was prior to coming here, I was reading a little bit into the history of copyright, and uh, it's a very, it's a very interesting um, thing brought up by the negative side about 
sort talking about the history of it and its uh, its relation into um, the international law and um, the copyrights in Switzerland, etc. Um, my point is this. There was recorded cases as early as the Tudor period in England and even further back then to, um, to ancient Ireland, if you can say, where they, cons where they have got quotes which talk about copyright or talk about the, the idea, the concepts behind copyright emerging. Um, do, whoever wants to do this, do you believe uh, that copyright as it was, it didn't, as we know it, didn't exist in those times and that it, it's um, been created and it's been put in, in law and it's now not so much been, not so much dying as it's sort of resurrected and then died as it was. Um. I'm going to cut you off there. Well, I think you just finished anyway, so that was the worst cut off in the history of the world. But thank you very much. I'm going to uh, throw to the panels either of those, the question about the historical context or uh, the question about values. Did anyone have anything to add to either of those contributions? I could speak to ancient Ireland. Please. <laughs> Colm Kill, the, the priest, visited St. Finian's Abbey, uh, St. Finian the Abbot, and uh, visited his library. And while he was in the library, he by hand made a copy of one of the books <coughs> in the library. And because he was a guest, the abbot didn't say anything. But when he left with his copy of the book that he had made, once he'd gone out the gate, the abbot sent a messenger after him and said, that copy belongs to me, Br bring it back. And Colm Kill didn't, didn't agree, and they took the dispute to the high king at Tara. And his decision was, to every cow belongeth its calf, and therefore, Colm Kill, the copy that you have made belongs by right to the abbot who owns the original book. People understood the ethics of copyright then, before there was a Copyright Act, and I think everybody can understand that now too. Thank you, Michael. Uh, thank you, Michael. Nicely brought back. It uh, did feel like a judgment of uh, how quickly I cut people off that I was running out of the library because uh, the abbot told me I'd miss my moment. But uh, I am going to ring the bell once we hit the minute, so please don't find me rude, but that's the way it goes. There are many of you to get through. We're going to go over this side. Marcus Wigan, a colleague of both Angela and Michael. Uh, I wish to point out something basic which both sides are going to disagree. One, copyright when it embodied mainly in physical devices, was used as a means of quarantining and limiting access to books, etc., in Australia. The digital version provided access. However, the other side seems to object to having access provided. Do people really think these two are equivalent? You probably don't know, but you can't even leave your iTunes library. It disappears when you die. Your Kindle documents will disappear if somebody accuses Amazon of marketing copyrightable materials. You will find yourself monitored in microterm detail and be criminalized simply for the commercial goals of price differentiation between the US and Australia. The products are not comparable. We need commentary from the panel on this issue. The change in rules to digital has changed the product and it has changed the relationship of the community to it. Piracy, as they describe it, may not be quite on the other side. Perhaps the piracy is ripping off your purchase licenses. The second use doctrine should live. Thank you. And we will get comment from the panel in a moment. Over to the left-hand side. 
Um, yeah, howdy. My name's Les, Les Kitchen, as bit of an echo. Uh, this is a question mainly for the against side, though I'd appreciate comments from the for side as well, um, if you can get through the echo. The for, uh, against side has been saying that without copyright as it stands now, authors would have no way of making a living. Now, for an author, say, who writes a book at 30 and dies at 80, then a book would be kept out of the public domain for 120 years, and it seems to me that's hardly necessary for the author to make a living. Uh, and also, I'd like to get the opinion of the panel on alternative economic means of authors making money, for example, crowdsourcing a work which is then put under, say, a Creative Commons license. Thank you. Thank you. Elmo, you look poised for speech. A little. Okay, so um, maybe this is a good time to like, maybe address a few myths that I think fly around this space. Um, one is that it is cheap to produce a digital good. That is just untrue. So it costs, the cost-benefit analysis is pretty similar unless you completely take people's labour costs out of the equation, which is not the reality of how anything is produced. So the idea that, you know, bands are making money from touring, so it's okay if you take their records, is an absolute fallacy. Touring is enormously expensive and it's profitable for very few musicians. And again, it's only once you get to be a certain stage of big that you get to make money from it, which is similar to how crowdfunding works. Crowdfunding is hitting the peak of diminishing returns. I don't know, probably a lot of people in this room maybe get two or three a week if you know enough people in the creative industries asking to have their product backed. So the time has sort of peaked where that was going to be viable. It's not going to be a viable long-term model. And you have to have a pretty significant profile in the first place for crowdfunding to work for you. Traditionally, that's going to come from backing from proper, not proper channels, but, you know, established channels that can afford to elevate someone to the point where they can then turn around and say, hey, do you want to fund this for me? But I think that people are starting to figure out that, you know, funding something that doesn't exist yet is is difficult as time goes on. So I think that crowdfunding is, is really not, you know, the light on the hill that people think it is. And again, that's pushed by a tech company who wants everyone to think that it is, and more than half of projects fail on Kickstarter. 56% of things don't come off. So that's my thoughts about that. Uh, I certainly don't think... Uh, crowdfunding uh, can be effective, um, but the idea that it's, that it's the only way forward or, or that there is only one way forward, I think, is, is erroneous. I think you need to accept that there will be a multitude of ways that, uh, that readers and writers or artists and, and consumers will... Um, will find each other and, and be rewarded for, for their effort. Um, another thing about the, the Creative Commons is that Creative Commons doesn't necessarily mean offering the work at zero cost initially. Um, you know, there's a, there's a range of, of Creative Commons options that are available to artists. I think the really critical thing behind it as, uh, as one of the means forward is that it's laying down very clear guidelines. Very, it's very distinct. Uh, that are very clear to, to the user what they can and can't do with the work. Over this side. I'm Luke. I'll make this quite quick. Um, I'll put this forward to both of you. Uh, rather than copyright being dead, is it the traditional business models of content delivery that are actually dead? Uh, companies like Netflix for movies, Steam for games have been incredibly successful uh, by building their business around new innovative ways of delivering content to people at fair prices where arcade industries like uh, the movies industry especially are suffering because of piracy and failing to innovate because they want to keep padding their bottom line for all the middlemen in the process. Thank you. We'll take one of here. Can I get a question from a woman? Sorry to uh, just change the order here a bit, but 
I have Sorry. to be very brave because English is a second language for me, but I thought it would be a good idea if someone who doesn't speak English in the English-speaking world here would be a, um, a good, as I said, a good idea. I'm a writer myself, I write in Polish, and we're talking here about making living. That's one thing. What really hurts me, it's uh, more like... Um, ethical thing, if I see my work on the internet and someone asks me to prove it, it's mine, to show my copyright, it really, it's not a pleasant feeling. And I always think, where do I go? Why do I have to prove it's my work? I work so hard to find something unique, because uniqueness makes me to keep writing and find, I'm a biographer. I. I write about post-war Polish migrants in Australia, and I really spend time, effort, money. This is not important. It's where is that ethic stealing someone's work? To whom would I pray? To whom do I address my... It's a question. Where do I go to protect my work? Thank you very much. It does strike me that the questions and the contributions from the panel are divided between the practical reservations and the ethical ones. Uh, I might throw the ethical question your way, uh, Team for the Affirmative. Does that side of things trouble you, the, the ethics of taking an artist's work without paying for it? <laughs> I've been talking too much. Um, actually, I think there are a couple of issues here. Um, firstly, kind of within copyright, you have kind of a quasi property right, but there's also the moral right as well to be recognized as the author. Um, and this is, a, they're actually two different things. And in other parts of the world, like I believe in some continental European systems, for instance, um, the, the kind of attribution right, the moral right has actually been kind of much more in the tradition than this whole idea of copyright as property. So I think that while copyright itself, this kind of propertization or commodification um, of creativity it may not be kind of working so well in the digital environment. I do think there's a strong kind of ethical element to ensuring that creators are acknowledged as creators. I'll just say my own personal experience as an author is that um, when I sold my book through my website, which is what a lot of creative artists now have the opportunity to do thanks to this new technology, uh, there were a lot of people who chose to um, to come directly to me to buy the book and they got value added. They got a signed book. Um, and so that gave me something and also gave them something. Uh, and I think that, you know, what we have to do is actually do what, in fact, a tweet from uh, Brendan Malloy who is one of the councillors of Pirate Party uh, said on, on Twitter here tonight, which is piracy is not a problem that needs solving. Business models need to adapt to a post-scarcity digital economy. Uh, and I think that why you need to have respect for the artist, the idea is how do you actually adapt to that economy in a way that allows the artist to interface directly with their followers. And technology lets you do that. Oh, look, there's so many issues in, in what's been said. I just want to make a couple of points, perhaps they kind of broadly cross some of the things we've heard. Firstly, corporations are not trying to stop access to content. Um, uh, and nor are they out there, by the way, um, putting uh, individuals in jail. Does anyone know anyone who's been to jail for copyright infringement here? Does anyone know? other than getting a letter from one's ISP recognising that you're downloading illegal content. That's probably about it. So let's, let's just not pretend that... Let's not pretend that anyone's criminalising individuals um, for Can I just copyright. stop you there for a tick? If you do have a contribution from the uh, floor, it is heartily encouraged. And uh, you'll be pleased to know we have a mechanism through which it can happen. <laughs> Um, do keep that in mind and be respectful of individuals as they speak. Sorry. So, um, but corporations are really not trying to stop access to co content. They are just trying to recoup the money that it took to make them. And for most creators, they've chosen to go um, with a particular distributor or production company or a studio or a, or a record. Th that is their choice. And again, I mean, th there are many examples of of creators um, 
on on the other side of the panel as well, um, who choose to give their work away for nothing or to choose other methodologies for funding the work and for um, distributing their work. That's not the issue. The issue is the choice of the creator, which piracy takes away. Piracy makes it uh, the consumer's decision about how they access the content, uh, regardless of how the creatives will recoup their revenue from it. And the effects can be quite long, um, long tail. It's not just about the revenue, particularly from that work. It could result in future works. A few, week, a few months ago, an Australian film called 100 Bloody Acres uh, went on screen. It did not succeed at the box office. But the filmmakers found out that um, they, there were over 35,000 streams, illegal streams of the film. And that's just streaming, that's not peer-to-peer and -peer downloading. And they're incredibly upset because they feel that when investors look at them for their next film, they won't be looking at um, the peer-to-peer -peer screening or the downloads. They'll be looking at the revenue from the box office to determine whether these people are worth investing in for a second film. Um, and they feel like they'll never get the funds to do that. So there are two sides to it. It really is the creator's choice. There has to be an internet that works for everyone, for consumers and for creators. Thank you, Laurie. Now we have just a couple more minutes for the floor debate, and here's what I'm going to do. There are four of you standing up. I'd ask you to keep it very brief in the statements, because I would also ask someone amongst the hecklers who feels passionately enough to get to the microphone and say their view in uh, in a short amount of time. Come on, have the courage. Onto a microphone. So we'll start at the left, and we're going to work through here. Well, uh, firstly, it's quite fascinating listening to both sides of the debate. Firstly, I'm speaking as someone who is a content creator, friends of a uh, friend of numerous content creators. I've licensed my own work under Creative Commons. I've had payments for that. I've paid for items licensed under Creative Commons licenses, various different types of Creative Commons licenses. I also speak as someone who, and I hope I'm not incriminating myself here, pirates a lot of stuff. I pirate it as a trial. This happens with software, with games, with music, with videos, and then if I like it, I buy it. I've discovered numerous music artists through pirating, and I buy their whole discography. One thing I wanted to point out was that there is an issue with content creators, not so much the creators as the copyright holders, sort of, sorry, I'll get to the point. Game of Thrones, fantastic example. In Australia, series one and two, we don't have time to go back to Tudor times on this. Sorry. It's just, just a pointer. We're going to have two more people. If you could have a sentence with a full stop on the end of it uh, now, that would be great. Foxtel outbid both Apple and QuickFlix in order to stop Australians from accessing it. This isn't the only time it's happened. It will happen more times a new system is needed. Thank you very much. And over this side. Thanks. Uh, Andrew Pam, also a colleague of Angela's. Um, I'm very disappointed that there are two fairly foundational points that haven't even been raised so far in the debate. Um, one of them is that the change of the technology fundamentally changes who is a creator. The original uh, creation of copyright law it was a situation where creators and artists were a small subset of the population. Now effectively everyone is a creator. As soon as you go online and make a comment about anything on a website, you are a creator, you have created copyright work. Copyright now applies to everyone, there is not some separate privileged class of authors. That is the first point that I have not yet heard raised. The second one, thank you, the second one is that economic value is not the only value. All content and media is also a cultural artifact that has cultural value. The fate of most of the content that is created is actually to be lost. It frequently will not go out of copyright until after it is no longer accessible and no one will ever know about it or hear about it again. The physical media may degenerate. And in fact, copying stuff is often the only way it is preserved through people who have chosen to copy it because they love it. Thank you very much. Now, the, le the lesson from here is brevity gets applause, okay? So we're over here on this side. Uh, 
in the recent Australian law reform review, um, you know, they came out with a bunch of recommendations, one of which was kind of interesting and was about setting up a second-hand market for digital files, in especially um, MP3s and music files. Um, you know, my job is to represent the interests of small businesses in the music industry, and I was asked for my comment um, in, throughout, you know, various news outlets, and I said it was a really bad idea. Uh, I can't understand how selling those files would result in any royalty going back to the artist. Then I read the Twitter responses to the article, and I got one thing which completely stumped me, and I can't work out what the answer and how to respond to it is. And it basically just said that it's an interesting problem. If you can't sell it or give it away, do you really own it? And if not, who does? Thank you very much. Over here. So it seems to me that over the last 10 years, we've basically had a choice of free next to the choice of paid. We've had a readily, trivially available pirated material primarily of popular media, things like robots throwing buildings at each other and Game of Thrones and pop singles. So has the quality, and it's a question to the negative, has the quality of the popular media diminished over the last 10 years, uh, perhaps due to uh, copyright infringement? We'll take that as a question for their uh, summing up. Uh, we've got one last uh, thing over here from, I think, one of our hecklers. Which would be yes, I am the heckler. Um, Sorry, I didn't realize there was only one of you. This You're is not bad. a question, it's a comment. Well, it's a heckle, counted as a heckle. Um, when my father was growing up, if he sung a song or if he played a game, he would be able to sing that song anywhere he wanted. He would be able to create new versions of that game with changed rules. There was a case recently where some children who created a YouTube video where the background music was the Ninja Turtles theme song. This was taken off YouTube. This is a problem because we don't own our own culture. Culture is something that ties people together. It is the fabric of humanity. And the fact that culture can be owned is wrong. Um, I have some more notes. Thank you. Thank you very much. I know. The, I'm sorry to cut you short, but that was very eloquent. It's a perfect note to end on. We can't give you the microphone every time you heckle. Ladies and gentlemen, you've heard many conflicting positions here. Thank you, sir. Uh, useful. Um, now, what's going to happen? What's going to happen is here's a democratic moment uh, where you can vote with your, I'd say your feet, but actually with tearing a little piece of paper. You have a piece of paper on your seat that says for or against. If you agree with the proposition, uh, then place the uh, part of the paper that says for in the box that's doing the round. If you disagree, put the part that says against. And if you are still undecided, uh, please put the entire untorn piece of paper into the box. Uh, now it's a time for summations. They, our panelists have two minutes each. Uh, so starting with Sule. Right. So I'm going to talk fast because there's a lot to refute here. Um, the really the key two key points that I want to three key points I want to refute is there are numerous cases of people being treated like criminals for copying work. Uh, Peter Sun's founder of Pirate Bay, sentenced to imprisonment, millions in fines. Aaron Schwartz, uh, who some of you may have heard by name, um, uh, committed suicide uh, earlier this year because he faced up to 30 years in prison for for copying there. And there, are, you know, all, when you, all you need is a nine-year-old girl in Norway whose house is raided and computer is seized to show you what overreach this is. Um, to the argument of there's no real way for creative artists to make income in their field, there is. I think it's just puppycock. What you have to say is the traditional ways may not be the way that artists can make money in their field. But thank God for the internet, because now it means that the artists can lower their production costs, create artistic creations in their lounge room, produce a CD like Gautier in his parents' base room with mattresses buffering the windows, um, and you know, then have it become a best-selling uh, piece of art and release it via his own website, going directly to his fans. The final thing I'd say is that there was much made in the um, initial uh, speaker uh, for the opposition uh, about the idea of copyright exists because the law books say it does. Now, what we would actually say is saying it doesn't make it so. As Angela said, 
we're in an era where we're engaged in mass civil disobedience. And the reason that copyright is dead, is dying and dead, is because the copyright industry, the lobbyists, have so overreached. They have so overreached and turned everything into a copyright police state that finally the citizens have just said, enough. We are not doing this anymore. And the result of that is that the de facto situation is that copyright is dead. So it may still be on the law books, but it is an act of civil disobedience where the people have declared it to be dead. And that's why copyright is dead. Thank you. <laughs> Michael Fraser. Thank you. Uh, copyright piracy is not a form of cultural heroism or a legitimate response to corporations of which you don't happen to approve. We should not substitute cynicism and theft for social understanding. Piracy is an attack on freedom of expression of creative people, of artists, on their right to make a livelihood directly from their work. And if we adopt this approach, we enter a vicious and dangerous cycle. It's the negation of the ideals on which our civilization is built, respecting work and the rights of property made by work. There are cultures that don't believe in that, and in a hard year they have to eat grass in the winter. There are some nations that are still trying that approach. No one is above the law. Why should we object to creative people getting, get, getting paid? The telcos get paid, the ISPs, the hardware people, the software people, the electricity utility. But the very object of the exercise, the creative original content that someone's spent years sweating over, they're the only ones that, that shouldn't get paid for their work? We don't mind Facebook and Google making billions. Why should we object to creative people getting paid for their work as well. We should educate our young people to respect their own creativity and then we'll respect the creativity of others. Simon Groth. I think we really need to accept that there is a difference between what we've used uh, copyright to control and the way that people are engaging with media today. There is a fundamental, fundamental difference between those two things. Um, one of the things that, that I did want to talk about was, was the solutions to this. Um, and there are no clear solutions. We're right at the beginning of this process. But the first step is to accept that there is a new paradigm at work here. How do we acknowledge, how do we record, reward creative work under the, and in this environment? And I think the first is a really intelligent application of the ideas, the spirit behind what copyright was initially intended to, to achieve. Um, part of that process, I think, is, is, as I was saying, to clearly delineate, to allow artists to clearly delineate how they would like their work to be used. But, and to hand control to the artist. There's another side to this, though, is that the artist needs to be able to accept that need to be able to hand control over to consumers as well. Um, but if the artist is at the centre of that transaction, then, and it's not necessarily a monetary transaction, but I think if there are readers and there are writers, then something in between happens, something really extraordinary, and that's something that is really worthwhile and something really valuable. And I think we need to find new ways to acknowledge that. Thank you. Um, I know you're all here tonight because you love films, televisions, music, games. So rather than waste my final two minutes arguing the obvious, and also you voted already, so there's not much point in it, I want to leave the final words to some great creatives, the very people who would be most affected if you decide tonight to vote that copyright is dead. So Jan Sardi is the screenwriter of Shine, The Notebook, and Mao's Last Dancer, amongst others. He says, I write to entertain, but it's also my livelihood. 
And that's because a writer's currency is the copyright we create in telling our stories. It's what pays the bills. And it's how we survive, often against the odds, in a highly competitive international industry. As any independent filmmaker will attest, getting our stories made and on screens is challenging enough as it is. Illegal downloading is copyright theft, and it represents a real threat to our ability to go on doing that. Jason Ballantyne, the editor of Great Gatsby, Wolf Creek, and currently Mad Max Fury Road, says, I'm a film editor. I'm pretty sure that when people illegally download films, they're not thinking about the impact this has on my profession and my livelihood. Let me tell you, it does. When film investors, both studios and individuals, are unable to recoup their money because of the effects of piracy, fewer films are made. When fewer films are made, jobs like mine become more scarce. And Steven Soderbergh, director of too many films to mention, says, theft is a big problem. I know this is a really controversial subject, but for people who think everything on the internet should be totally free, all I can say is, good luck when you have to try have a life and raise a family living off something you create. Thank you. Thank you. So I think at the root of copyright is a balance between the right of the creator and the right of the public to, public to access knowledge. And actually, this balance is also enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. However, currently the balance is tipped away from both creators and consumers of, in favour of big content corporations um, who are wanting to enforce some kind of digital scarcity when there is in fact plenty. Um, and I think as well that the increased restrictions on digital copyrighted content, which are more than and more severe than the restrictions on, tangible phys on their tangible physical counterparts. Um, as one of the um, speakers from the floor says, I mean, you can't sell or transfer legally, much legally bought digital content. Um, for people of at least my age and over, and by the way, I can still just about remember the world before the internet, although anyone younger than me probably can't. Um, these kind of increased restrictions on digital copyrighted content are new, weird, and counterintuitive on many levels. Um, so I would conclude by, in fact, saying to everyone not to worry that even that creation and innovation have happened way before copyright was invented and exported to the rest of the world as a form of legal imperialism and will exist after copyright as we know it dies. So long live the pirates. <laughs> I don't know, I'm depressed in a way that this is even a debate that we have. If she, people should be able to make a living from what they create, that seems like just an incredibly sad thing that we're even asking. Um, and I agree that, that copyright as it currently is, is not working, but there is a fairness to be struck between the ability for people to make a living and the ability for these companies that have just profited off that to continue. So at the moment, it's kind of horrifically skewed in the wrong way. And if someone tells you that you shouldn't be doing what you're doing because it's wrong to take other people's property and you just don't think that that's anything that you should ever listen to, none of us will ever convince you otherwise. If you think that that's fine, that's cool. That's what you've chosen to do. But it's not the way to go forward to think about how to change things. The idea that you can just take what you want is wrong. And creativity flourishes where there is copyright. It has and it always will. There is just basic fairness that has to be put in our minds when we're going forward, when we're acknowledging that there is a digital economy and that it produces far less reward than traditional disrupted now economies did previously, and to be realistic about the fact that this is where we are now and how can we go forward and make sure that it is equitable for all sides. Thank you, and a big round of applause for our panel. You wouldn't steal a car, you wouldn't steal a handbag, you wouldn't steal the television. I, I think what we can agree is both sides have made me feel really depressed about my Apple products that I love so much at home. That's, that's a byproduct of this evening that I hadn't anticipated. Uh, look, a big thank you to our marvelous panel of speakers, Sue Ella Dreyfus, Michael Fraser, Simon Groth, Laurie Flexer, Angela Daly, and Elmo Keep. Another big round of applause for all of them.
Our next controversial debate is on Tuesday the 12th of November and the topic is True Reconciliation Requires a Treaty. It promises to be a fiery note to end the year of debates on. Uh, but tonight, uh, you're all pre-polled on the stairs and in the foyer on the way in and the results there, 24% of you are undecided on the way in and a fairly even 37% were against the proposition and 39% were for the proposition. After the debate, only 15% were left undecided. 36% uh, of you uh, were against the proposition, and with an overwhelming majority, 49% uh, for the proposition, I find the motion passed. And finally, before I send you out into the evening, given that tonight's proceedings will go on the internet and have been filmed for the Wheeler Centre uh, and for ABC Big Ideas, let me sing happy birthday to... No, that, that's a bad idea. I think I'll just let you go. Thank you very much.